My name is Adam Shoemaker and I'm rector here at St. Stephen's Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to worship on this, the second Sunday of the Easter season. Next Sunday, April the 18th, will be our third Sunday of the month Eucharistic service. And so please do reach out to Amanda Rucker in our office if you would like to pick up a pre-consecrated wafer uh, in the coming days. Friends, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The first lesson comes from Acts. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, how good and pleasant it is when brethren live together in unity. It is like fine oil upon the head that runs down upon the beard. Upon the beard of Aaron and runs down upon the collar of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon that falls upon the hills of Zion. For there the Lord has ordained the blessing, life forevermore. The second lesson comes from 1 John. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testified to it, and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk with him in the light as he himself is the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for only ours, or ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. As he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, 
they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, was one of the twelve, and was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do you not doubt, but believe? Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God and that through believing you may have life in his name. Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. In today's gospel reading, we enter a scene following the resurrection of Jesus. And though we are looking back on this story with the benefit of hindsight, we have read all the spoilers and we know how the story is going to end. These days, as they were living through them, these days after the crucifixion and after the resurrection, they must have been terribly confusing to live through. These disciples in this story, especially at the start of today's story, are a group of traumatized folk. So many things have happened to them in such a short amount of time. They have seen their beloved teacher crucified. They've been seized with fear for themselves. They felt the shame and despair of dreams and hopes that died with Jesus. And then, just a few days after the crucifixion, on the early morning of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene, or other women with her, depending on which gospel you're reading, they found the tomb empty, and they ran to share the news. What has happened? Has someone stolen the body? Has someone defiled the grave? And then two of the disciples went on a mad dash to the tomb and saw with their own eyes that the linen wrappings that bound the body of Jesus were discarded on the floor of the tomb. What could this mean? And then Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene as she wept. What was that? A ghost? A vision? Was that Mary gone mad with grief? Is it any wonder that our next scene the following Sunday, we find the disciples huddled together in a house with the doors locked. Is it any wonder after all of that, that they were afraid? Afraid of religious authorities, afraid perhaps of Roman soldiers looking for followers of the crucified teacher, afraid for themselves, afraid for their families. So they locked the doors and they huddled together, seeking solace and community with one another in the midst of their confusion and their grief. What will we do, they must have asked. Where will we go? Do you think that Mary really saw Jesus? 
Do you think he really is alive? But there was one disciple missing from that group, one of the 12, Thomas. He was not with the disciples in the locked room. We don't know where he was. Scripture doesn't tell us. We just know that he was gone. Some people deal with trauma by retreating into community, and some deal with trauma by retreating into their families, and some deal with trauma by retreating into themselves. And some people, things just happen, and they are cut off from an experience of community through no fault of their own, through no choice of their own. So we don't know what happened to Thomas or why he wasn't there when all of a sudden Jesus appeared in the locked room. We don't know where Thomas was, but we do know that the other disciples were there to witness it. And imagine for a moment the shock they must have felt at that moment. Imagine their joy. A dead man, their friend, their teacher, who is somehow alive in this new way. Their teacher moving through walls, appearing in the flesh, breathing life into frightened disciples, bringing hope where there had been despair. The joy must have been overwhelming. But Thomas wasn't there for any of that. And so when the disciples find Thomas, when they seek him out and hunt him down and say, Thomas, we have seen Jesus, he lives. Well, Thomas does not believe them. Now, Thomas's refusal to believe in this moment has given him the label of doubting Thomas in our popular culture and our theology. It's used as a slang for someone who needs proof before they will believe another person's story. And this label also has a bit of a pejorative tinge to it, doesn't it? Jesus does say, after all, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed, which does seem to imply that Thomas failed in some way. But consider, the disciples didn't believe Mary's story either, not really. And each gospel has stories of disciples misunderstanding Jesus or making mistakes. So I don't know if Thomas deserves to be painted as unfaithful just because he is reluctant to believe the disciples' story of the resurrected Jesus. Maybe Thomas was just heartbroken. After all, he had lost his beloved teacher in the most violent and public way possible. And then for whatever reason, he was separated from the disciples in the immediate aftermath. Or maybe, Thomas is coming across as skeptical because he was simply a grounded and practical person, the kind of reliable person we would all want as a friend. He could no more believe that a dead man was alive than you or I could go to a funeral and then believe a friend who told us the dead man came over for supper that night. I wouldn't believe that person either. Thomas was already despairing and confused and this weird story from the other disciples must have seemed a little indecent, a little macabre, preposterous even. And so I hear his insistence on proof to touch the nail prints, to feel the wounds, not as a statement of cold and clinical skepticism, but as a cry from a broken heart, as someone who wants to believe, even though it, it just doesn't seem like it could be real. And I think that's how Jesus heard it too. After all, Jesus could have completely written off Thomas for his lack of faith. For that 
matter, so could the rest of the disciples. They could have decided among themselves that the real in-group were the folks who actually saw Jesus and that there was no room for folks like Thomas, certainly if they were going to question the disciples' experience. But that's not what they did. Instead, the community of disciples embraced Thomas, embraced him in all of his questioning, in all of his heartbreak, in all of his fear and uncertainty. The disciples had compassion for Thomas. He was with them, after all, in the house a week later. He was with them. He was still part of the group. And when Jesus appeared again, he spoke specifically to Thomas, offering Thomas just what he had said he needed in order to believe, to touch the wounded hands and side of the risen Christ. Thomas needed to see. He needed compassion. He needed healing for his heartbreak. And Jesus gave him just what he needed. I think about how easy it has been for me and maybe for you to struggle on the road of faith, to sometimes doubt in God's presence, to despair, to lose hope. I think about how easy it can be to deny resurrection, to worry that maybe there is no light, only darkness. Like Thomas, there are times when all of our hopes and all of our reason and all of our practicality and all of our experience may lead us on the journey into a desert. A desert where we could begin to stumble. The Christian mystics understand this process as a critically important stage on the spiritual journey. A time where we are invited to learn what faith means when all seems to be darkness. A time to learn that Jesus is present even when we are not aware of it. What I learned from Thomas is the importance of being honest with our faith, honest with ourselves and with God, and that we shouldn't hide our struggles under a veneer of piety but ask for what we need in prayer. What I learned from the disciples is that our community should strive to be inclusive of all of those who are on the journey of faith, including those who are questioning, including those who are struggling, including those who barely have any faith left at all. And what I learned from Jesus is that he will meet us in the midst of our questions, in the midst of our darkness, in the midst of our insistence on practicality. He will meet us perhaps where and when we least expect him. So this week, I invite you to check in with your faith. Notice where you are in the story of Thomas. Notice where you are in your own story. Are you struggling with your faith journey? We are living in Easter hope, but we also know all too well the darkness. If you are feeling doubt and uncertainty and questioning, please know that does not mean you have lost your faith. The author Anne Lamott says that faith includes noticing the mess, the emptiness and discomfort and letting it be there until some light returns. Can you wait in this present darkness patiently for the light to shine again? For when you will once more be able to confess the faith with a full and grateful heart? And if you find yourself in this story in the disciples' position, if you are feeling that Easter joy in your whole being, if you are feeling that new life, if you feel confident in God's grace and goodness, then this week I invite you, like the disciples, to reach out in love to those who are struggling. How can you include them on your journey? It's not about converting people. It's about loving people. 
There is no record in scripture of the disciples badgering Thomas until he acquiesced to a statement of doctrine. They just included him. They just loved him. Come, eat with us. Come be with us. Join us on our journey. These days, there is no shortage of folks who are struggling who could use some love and support and inclusion. There's no shortage of folks who are searching for God, searching for a place to belong, searching for a witness. How will you be that witness? Amen. Please join me in confessing the faith of the church in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, she is worshiped and glorified. She has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of the People In this Easter season, we pray for the Church, including Bishop Curry and Bishop Parsley. We pray for St. Albans and King Street. In the spirit of reconciliation, mediation, and the way of love, we pray for St. Luke's and St. Paul's in Charleston, whom we long to be together with in mission and purpose. We pray for the Diocesan Standing Committee and the Diocesan staff. We also pray for our nominees to be our next Diocesan Bishop, the Reverend Jeffrey M. St. John Ford, the Reverend Kevin Allen Johnson, the Reverend Canon Terence Alexander Lee, the Venerable Calhoun Walpole, and the Reverend Canon Ruth M. Woodliffe Stanley. We pray for the earth, the world, those in need, and all the member of God's family, responding to each petition with the words, hear our prayer. We pray, O God, for all the churches around the globe, for the bishops and clergy, for the newly baptized, for the believers who cannot assemble for worship, for faithful endurance during this time of sorrow and distress, and for a deepening sense of your presence among us. O oh God, you are our temple. In your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, O oh God, for the well-being of creation, for the health of seas and rivers and lakes, for the Ashley and the Cooper, and for the will to care for your earth. O oh God, you are our rainbow of promise. In your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, O oh God, for peace and justice in the world, for an end to war and international turmoil, for concord in our troubled society, for the heads of state, legislators, and local civic leaders that they enact wise procedures to deal with the coronavirus. O oh God, you are a mighty fortress. In your mercy, hear our prayer. 
We pray, O oh God, for all who are facing the coronavirus, for all who mourn their dead, all who have contracted the virus, those who are quarantined or stranded away from home, those who have lost their employment, those who fear the present and the future. We pray for physicians, nurses, and home health aides, medical researchers, and the World Health Organization. Fill the aching in our hearts with your merciful power. O oh God, you are our everlasting arms. In your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, O oh God, for all in need, for those suffering for the faith, for those who are poor, hungry, and homeless, for those who are sick and those awaiting death, and for those we name before you here. O oh God, you are the healer of our every ill. In your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, O oh God, for the desires of our hearts. I ask your prayers for the following. David Williams, Janine Fiedler and family, Esther Ferguson, Mary Lou Titus, Mary Lou Thompson, Rose Adams, Peg Gum, Bill Marie, Donna Labraska, William Ravenel, Linda Brights, Casey Miller, Mara, Mary Pamela Landry, Jody, Mike Callahan, Brett Barnum, and Katie Garrett and family. And for those serving our country, including Malik Spruill, Tyrese Watson, Letitia Watson Franks, Edward Pritchard, Herbert Jordan Drayton, Nicholas Loving, Ryan Savage, and Bill Gibson. O oh God, you are our heart's desire. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive our thanks for all who died in the faith, especially remembering Margot Callahan and Richard, and bring us at the final resurrection into your everlasting life, where sorrows will be no more. O oh God, our beginning and our end, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your gracious and mighty hands, O oh God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Now the clear paved rise and from the buried grave, we eat that in dark earth many days have lain, nor lives again that with the dead have been. seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a barren and dry land where there is no water. Therefore I have gazed upon you in your holy place, that I might behold your power and your glory. For your loving kindness is better than life itself. My lips shall give you praise. So will I bless you as long as I live 
and lift up my hands in your name. My soul is content as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth praises you with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the night watches. For you have been my helper, and under the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. My soul clings to you. Your right hand holds me fast. And now the children and youth of St. Stephen's will lead us in the Lord's Prayer. O oh, Father, who art in heaven, I'll be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. In union, O Lord, with faithful Eucharistic people throughout the world, we offer you our thanks and praise. We present to you our souls and bodies, earnestly desiring that we may always be united with you. You promise, O Christ, to be present with us in the sacrament of your body and blood. So with confidence we claim your presence among us during this Eucharistic fast. Come into our hearts and unite us with you and one another. May your healing grace abound. Let nothing ever separate you from us. May we live in you and you live in us, both in this life and in the life to come. Amen. And now please join me in saying a general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. May Almighty God, who has redeemed us and made us his children through the resurrection of his Son, our Lord, bestow upon you the riches of his blessing. Amen. May God, who through the water of baptism has raised us from sin into newness of life, make you holy and worthy to be united with Christ forever. Amen. May God, who has brought us out of bondage to sin into true and lasting freedom in the Redeemer, bring you to your eternal inheritance. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen.
Hallelujah. Let us go forth in the name of the risen Christ. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.